all of Asia, free Asia, as well as communist Asia, is watching Vietnam. And if, for example, out of this present struggle, after making this great commitment, after turning around the psychology in Asia, we then agree to a coalition government with the communist, or we force the South Vietnamese into a neutralized position, a neutralize it as we did Laos, or if we make any kind of territorial concessions to the Viet Cong, either one of these three courses of action would be interpreted as a retreat and also a defeat, not only for South Vietnam, but for the United States. We had an extended interview, almost two hours, with Ho Chi Minh. It was perfectly clear in the course of that interview that Ho Chi Minh was delivering to us certain information he expected us to deliver back to the State Department. And on the side of Ho Chi Minh, understand that first of all, he will bring to the negotiation the prestige of an unparalleled life of devotion to his country. In the history of this century, he will be the great patriot. And be careful here. Don't forget that he is a Marxist. And don't expect him to turn a traitor to the ideal of his life. He was unyielding on the point that the bombing had to halt before his negotiators would enter into any kind of substantive discussions. But I think he was trying to make the point, making it repeatedly, that after that the agenda was open. Now there may be those who say, well, obviously, and you haven't offered them enough. Well, it's true that we haven't offered them South Vietnam. And it is true that we have not agreed to assure them that we will stop the bombing on a permanent and unconditional basis. We discovered some time later, when the correspondence was made public by Hanoi, that four days before our letter could arrive uh, in Hanoi, a letter arrived there sent over President Johnson's signature, which was a very hard-line letter indeed, which restated all the previous conditions regarding cessation of the bombing and even added some new ones, and which was, in our judgment, intended to do what it did do, which was to break off any possibility of negotiation at that time. This letter, we subsequently learned, had been written two days before ours was written in conjunction with the State Department. We found to our surprise and shock, I might say, that Harriman was already saying that he proposed to negotiate the settlement by suggesting that there had to be some reciprocal military action in return for the final cessation of the bombing. In other words, the same point that Johnson had been standing on before he made the speech of March 31st. It was almost as though Harriman turned off his hearing aid when we told him that this would not work, this was not the understanding the North Vietnamese had, and they would certainly repudiate it if he attempted to take that position at the bargaining table. And this, of course, is what did happen at Paris. In the view of the North Vietnamese, the reciprocity means the United States is bombing North Vietnam, and North Vietnam must bomb the United States. This, in their view, is reciprocity. Since North Vietnam is not bombing the United States, the United States should not bomb North Vietnam. The general impression that um, I came away with, and I think here I would speak for my colleague Bill Baggs, was that we were dealing with the State Department on a basis of what we have come to call Fulbright's Law, never trust the State Department. Bombing is going on in the South. We haven't bombed anybody's embassy in Hanoi, but they bombed our embassy in Saigon. Arms continue to flow, men continue to come. We've tried in all over the earth to find an answer to the question, what else would stop if the bombing stopped? The niceties of the argument about whether there are two Vietnams or one Vietnam seem quite inconsequential when you're talking to Ho Chi Minh. It would seem incredible that this man does not speak for most of the Vietnamese, not all, but most. And the idea that there could be some arbitrary geographic dividing line that would cut off his influence has been proved an absurdity 
by the vigor and determination of the National Liberation Front that fights in his name in the South. My name is Olivier Todd. I'm a journalist on the non-communist, liberal, left-wing French paper, Le Nouvel Observateur. I first went to South Vietnam when escalation started in 1965, and I first went to North Vietnam at the end of 1967. Uh, I'm Harrison Salisbury of the New York Times, uh, assistant managing editor of the Times. I'm uh, Father Daniel Berrigan. Uh, I'm working here at Cornell teaching and uh, helping with the peace movement. It's about one month since I was in North Vietnam on a project to get the three American flyers out. At the time I went to, to uh, North Vietnam, the uh, communiques uh, which were being issued by Washington in particular about the American bombing raids on the North gave the impression, although they did not say so specifically, uh, that we were not killing uh, civilians in any substantial numbers, at least, uh, in the course of our very heavy bombing offensive. Uh, indeed, uh, President Johnson himself uh, said that the targets were uh, steel and concrete. I think almost anyone familiar with war uh, would have been somewhat skeptical of the ability to bomb with such precision. And indeed, when I got on the spot in uh, North Vietnam, I discovered, of course, that uh, while the bombs presumably had been aimed toward military objectives as best the aviators could aim them, they indeed did kill many civilians, uh, demolished large areas of civilian housing. Before I left for North Vietnam, I was under the impression that it was a small country that was just sort of vaguely fighting back. But after seeing many battles against American planes from the banks of the Red River, I changed my opinions completely. The anti-aircraft in North Vietnam, in certain packed pockets, as the American pilots say, is absolutely formidable. It's a sort of four-level affair. You have uh, people equipped with submachine guns and rifles shooting at a first level, forcing the planes to go up to a second level, where there they come against the s machine guns, a lot of them being Chinese. And then they're forced up to a third level, which is that of the ordinary guns, most of them, I would say, Russian. And after that, they go up to a level where they meet the SAMs, and I would have been told that these SAMs were antiquated. Well, in fact, they are not. They are formidably powerful. During one week in October, I saw at least 11 planes in five days being shot by the North Vietnamese anti-aircraft defense. When you walk about the streets of Hanoi, uh, you are struck by the fact that you constantly see uh, civilians going about uh, in trucks uh, with the guns uh, in their arms, or even walking down the streets with guns strapped to their back. It's unusual to see so many people with uh, guns in their hands, and it's most unusual to see this in a communist country. One evening, on the road to Haiphong, we were bombed 300 yards from where we were, and with my interpreter, we immediately went uh, onto the side road. I was very frightened. I was terribly frightened. But as soon as we bumped into a machine gun nest, fear disappeared. And the government has understood this, and I think this is one of the reasons why it has armed most of the population.